All right, so thank you for joining us for the next installment of the GVI workshop series. Um, today is going to be a deep dive into direct communication, which we'll get into in a few minutes what exactly that means. But just first, a uh, little bit of overview about us and our organization. My name is Michael Akampora. I'm a research and policy advisor here at NNSC. I'm joined by multiple members of our team, uh, Talib Hudson, Michael Getzler, Megan McDonald, and Paul Smith will be today's speaker amongst a couple of our other colleagues. Um, so what is NNSC? NNSC is uh, the National Network for Safe Communities, is an action research center based at John Jay College here in New York that implements proven strategic interventions. Um, NNSC's mission is to reduce violence, build trust, and transform public safety in partnership with communities around the world. So we're focusing on one of those interventions as part of this workshop series, the Root Violence Intervention or GVI. But during the course of this workshop and other workshops, we'll touch on some of our other interventions, including the intimate partner violence intervention, uh, interventions targeted at open air drug markets and work on prison violence and interventions similar to this work that apply there. Um, so what is this workshop series itself? So the workshop series is meant for new, interested, and returning partners to this work. So NNSC is the national network. We're a network of sites around the country and around the world that are already committed to doing this work. But these workshops are for new partners, uh, folks who haven't been doing this work, folks who are interested in this work, or folks who are working in sites or jurisdictions or cities where this work is ongoing, but they themselves are new to the work and want to learn more about it. Uh, these workshops are a space to learn and discuss the field of violence prevention, learn about focused deterrence, and new innov innovations and interventions in the field. You'll hear from experienced NNSC staff members and professionals doing violence prevention work around the country and participate in roundtable conversations and discussions about the topics each week, in this case, direct communication. Uh, these sessions are open to all, any and all, who are interested in exploring the GVI approach to violence reduction in their communities, whether it's community-based organizations, social service providers, law enforcement members, support and outreach workers, municipal workers, academics, anyone interested in learning about this work and doing this work is welcome here, and you're welcome to invite them to the next session if they weren't able to make it today. So with that, I think we're going to just do some quick introductions. Uh, head into breakout rooms for a few minutes and just do round robin saying uh, who you are, why you're here, why you're interested in this work. And then we'll come back for today's featured presentation on direct communication. I'll toss it over now to my colleague, Talib Hudson, to introduce today's main event, uh, the featured presentation on direct communication. And we'll go from there. Talib, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. The point of today's session is talking about direct communication. And as you may have just experienced, sometimes it's not always what you say, but also how you say it. And we'll get into more of that with Paul, who was wonderful and, and fantabulous um, at discussing this, but really wanna make sure that folks are oriented to what we're talking about today. In last session, we talked about talking to the right people and identifying the right people and really focusing on the really small, small number of folks who are most involved and engaged with the most serious violence. And we talked about how to identify who those folks are. And part of the reason we wanna do that is because we, don't, we wanna make sure that resources are directed not only in an efficient way, but we wanna make sure that resources are directed in a way that is just, that is respectful, um, and in a way that ultimately builds up people and communities in our effort to reduce violence. Part of that whole effort is the direct communication pieces. Once you've identified folks and you've seen who the narrow folks, the narrow amount of folks are that you really wanna direct resources to, how do you now communicate to them in a way that is uh, effective, that is impactful, uh, but also that is just and, uh, and, and works toward the, the overall goal of not only reducing violence, but building trust um, and, and building safer communities together, as Paul always said. 
So without further ado, I, I'd like to introduce uh, my, my colleague and in some ways my predecessor at NNSC uh, when I first came here, someone whom I have learned uh, so much from um, in my time here, uh, someone who was just uh, really a wizard. His, he has filled so many roles from being a project manager himself to being an, an advisor to, to running the Chicago office to now uh, running our reconciliation and legitimacy aspects. He, he really knows so much about this work from so many angles. And I, I feel fortunate to be able to hear from him again. Uh, so let me introduce my colleague, Paul David Smith. All right, uh, thank you, Talib, much appreciation. And, and thank you, Michael and the team for bringing us together. Um, let's get right into the presentation. Uh, we have a, a little bit of ground to cover today and I'm hoping that we'll have a rich discussion afterwards. Uh, let me try to share my screen here. All right, did I do that right? We good? Okay. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to try not to repeat a lot of the things that my colleagues have already said. Uh, let me do myself a favor and take myself off camera for this glare off my bald head uh, distracts me and we can go right into the work here. So direct communication is what we're talking about today. And if there are any questions or if there's anybody with experience who's done this as well, please feel free to hop in. Don't wanna make this a, a simple uh, sit and get. But as a quick overview, the, the operational approach that we have to reducing violence also looks to build trust between communities and criminal justice agencies. And when I say communities, let me be specific and say communities of color. Um, and in our community, in most of our communities, we pick one. So the black community, black, brown communities and communities that we're talking about. So we really want to, and you'll hear me say this word a lot, uh, legitimacy, we want to enhance legitimacy by explicitly breaking with those harmful pr past practices uh, that have been done by law enforcement, where you've had over enforcement uh, in, in certain communities and under protection in those same communities. And we really want to recognize the power of people who are, are members of the community but they're not sworn members of the community. They're informal social control. Uh, this is Ms. Mabel who goes to the mailbox with a moo on. This is uh, Tyrone who works down the street. Anybody who lives in the community who can exert informal social control uh, as a member of the community without being uh, the police, uh, that we really wanna recognize the power that they have. And then we also uh, wanna talk about uh, trauma and victimization as they happen um, and, and as it has happened in involving violence with people. And then also how we use law enforcement sanctions very strategically and as little and as sparingly as possible. And our whole goal here is to keep people safe, alive and out of prison. So how this works, and I know most people on here are fairly new to the work. Uh, so uh, for those of you who have been who are experienced and you've been doing this a while, uh, please uh, don't take this refresher as a cut. And please feel free to hop in if there are gaps or things that you think may enhance the, uh, the discussion here. So um, uh, we really work to identify and you will work at the site level to identify as quickly as possible and as real time as possible the very, very small numbers of people who are at the highest risk, as my colleague Talib just mentioned, uh, those same individuals, once we know them, some of them are already known to you, uh, you'll open the lines of communication uh, as respectfully as possible and as direct as possible with those individuals who are in that small cadre of folks who may or may not be driving the violence. And then we quickly establish queer, uh, clear standards uh, against the violence, but for the people. So we want the individuals we're talking to to be successful in life, but we have uh, clear standards against the violence uh, that they may be involved in. And then the other part of that is offering real support, uh, support that people can say is tangible, it's real and it's accessible and keeping them safe, alive, and as I said before, out of prison. The last part of this is to just keep bear in mind that we wanna reserve strategic sanctioning and any consequences that come from uh, law enforcement as a last resort 
and make sure that uh, that folks know that that is not the goal here. The goal is not to increase incarceration. The goal is not to increase uh, uh, arrests. The goal is to reduce violence while reducing incarceration and reducing arrest in the community. But still, the police still have to be, be the police and the community is still the community. Uh, when folks want to shoot, uh, that's when they'll have the full attention of law enforcement and those who are working uh, to reduce violence in the community. So here's what we know. Uh, most of the violence that happens in a community is not driven by most of the people in the community. It's a very small percentage of highly active people. And this very small percentage of highly active people are, are usually, um, uh, they're, they're usually responsible for 60, 70, 75, 80% of the most serious violence in any uh, community. It doesn't matter if they have the, the technical term gangs or not, uh, because what we're talking about here is groups. We're not basically talking about gangs. All gangs are groups, but not all groups are gangs. You have some groups that are just drug clues, crews. They're just cliques. Uh, they're guys who are maybe in a rap group together, what have you. So we're talking about group dynamics, not just gang dynamics. And if we were just try to look at this from a gang perspective, uh, a lot of information and data gets lost <clears throat> when we just focus on gangs. If we focus on in, uh, groups because of their gang statutes, uh, we'll miss a lot of information. And if you just look at the groups that exist in our communities today, most of the groups that, that exist today do not look like the groups that were said to have existed decades ago. You'll find a loose association of guys who are, who are with each other today and hate each other tonight. Uh, folks who don't know each other tonight, but they're on the same team tomorrow. So when we're looking at those dynamics, that dynamic is carried by the groups, the groups carry the street code, and the street code helps to drive the violence. And that's what we want to work towards addressing today. So it's a three-pronged partnership. Uh, this is stuff that you all know. The community uh, moral messengers, the community moral uh, folks, uh, the, you're talking about uh, folks who are your grandma, surviving community members. You're talking about people in the community um, who, as I said before, are not sworn members of the community. They're just representatives of the community and they're recognizable by the individuals who, in, in their roles, by the individuals who direct messaging will happen with. And then there's law enforcement. Law enforcement includes police agencies, uh, prosecutors, probation and parole, federal agencies. Their role in this uh, is really to identify those groups driving the most violence, identify those at the highest risk, and then concentrate their efforts on those folks. Uh, they're the ones who give the message of deterrence up front, and they let people in uh, in the groups know that, you know, about the partnerships, their focus on gun violence, and their desire to not come in and do business as usual with arresting folks, uh, trying to arrest their way out of it, uh, stop and frisk, saturation patrols and whatnot. Their message is that they want to keep the community safe alive and out of prison, uh, just like everyone else who we'll talk about here. And then the social service providers, uh, their role, that outreach, uh, when, when you go and do outreach to individuals, you have to bring them back to something. So when you're bringing them back to something, it's it's the, the social service providers that provide meaningful uh, kinds of things, uh, meaningful engagement, meaningful uh, uh, the, uh, outreach and support that they bring into the table, mentoring programs, cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma care, uh, reentry, and the like. So in, in discussing this, I really hey. want to get into- You too. I heard from uh, Brother Alexander. Sorry, I, I want to get into how it works. This initiative works to replace uh, traditional enforcement as much as possible with community standards of influence. And that means your school teachers, your school principals, the, the folks who drive the buses, your, your pastors, uh, your imams, folks in the community who, who uh, your aunties, your activists, folks who exist in the community and want to see violence uh, reduced, but understand that their voice is powerful and important in the process. Uh, it works to explain uh, how law enforcement is going to operate moving forward. So it, in, in many ways, it puts people on prior notice. And then that, that explicit commitment to enhancing legitimacy. I said, you'll hear me say that a lot. 
Uh, it really works to make sure that the messaging is lit uh, legitimate, but also the activities amongst the partners, especially the police, uh, are legitimate as well. How do we do that? There are a number of methods of communication that we employ. Number one, uh, and one that most people hear about initially, is the call in. So the call in, is, it's a face to face meeting between uh, those who are part of the GBI initiative, the partnership. Uh, this would be uh, the, the chief of police. Uh, this would be your uh, the, the, the prosecutors, federal and state, uh, very likely a lieutenant who will present what the enforcement action look like, a demonstration enforcement action look like. And then they'll hear from other people in the community who are not sworn. These are your, uh, your, your, your community moral voices. This is your voice of pain. That's a mother who's lost a child of violence. I'll talk about her in just a bit. Um, an individual who's been there, done that, used to run the streets, um, has, has gotten their life turned around and they wanna see others do the same. Your social service providers, uh, and then people who carry that inspirational code in the community that when they speak, they inspire others to go higher. Those all meet in the in the uh, call in, and I'll discuss that in open app just a little bit. Um, but then there's a custom notification. This happens on the street. Uh, it's 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 flexible. You're able to do it without two or three months planning. Matter of fact, sometimes it takes maybe 20 minutes planning to get a custom notification done, and they're specific. They're given to specific individuals for specific reasons. Uh, while they can be used broadly uh, to, to get the dosage of the messaging out there, they're really used in many ways for specific reasons. And then your community and police response to victims of violence, your CPRVV, those are designed to address victims and, and really look at victimization tables and look at how to address victims who may themselves have survived a shooting or victims who are survivors of someone who was lost uh, to a shooting. And so the call in, it's that face-to-face -face meeting where the GVI message, the, the deterrence message is delivered by a number of partners together to individuals representing groups who are called into a meeting. In that meeting, law enforcement, or for that meeting, law enforcement identifies members of violence groups. They'll get with uh, police and probation and parole. People who come to call-ins who are called in are most of the time um, on probation or parole, and their attendance in the call-in is a condition of their probation or parole, which means instead of meeting at their probation officer's uh, uh, office or instead of meeting at a, another designated place, the probationers will meet at the call in and they'll sit for 60 minutes to hear the call in uh, messages as each partner delivers specific messages that attendees are told to take back to the individuals who they know who are not at this meeting. So the call in is a real opportunity for people uh, involved in groups to understand. Uh, my, 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 my former colleague Chris Millette says to understand and receive free legal advice, free legal information from law enforcement, and to hear mess more messages from communities uh, as they work to access the help. The calling gives people an explanation um, uh, about the violence, the understanding that law enforcement has about the violence. I mentioned the speakers earlier, but each of these uh, speakers brings a specific message to the call in, uh, which all penultimate message is we want to see you safe, alive, and out of prison. We'll help you, but we'll stop you if you make us. So the support and outreach piece is really the, the, the place where we, that we get most of our direct communication. While a call-in takes anywhere from a month to two to three months to plan and put together and coordinate a lot of streams, the outreach uh, doesn't take that much coordination. So the, the spirit of that and the reason for that is help is uh, a moral and practical obligation. We have a moral imperative, as Michael Fullen said uh, a while back, to address extensive violence uh, and trauma that that violence has caused in this country. And in any of our sites, any of our communities, uh, we want to help uh, by giving a genuine offer of help for individuals to change their lives. And then create safety planning for folks, making sure that, uh, th that they know how to access uh, safety and how to access things, people, and entities that will help them achieve safety and while they themselves are not participating in violence. 
And then really it helps to proceed to change perceived notions around violence. Uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about that as we get into the, the presentation, but really we want to build new relationships that are uh, positive, uh, provide stability and provide relationships that need that are meaningful to individuals. It's the right thing to do. And fundamentally, it's what interrupts uh, cycles of violence and in many ways stops the violence. So the framework of the support and outreach as we do direct communication, of course, uh, as I told you, is to keep people safe, alive and out of prison and doing real affirmative outreach, which means you're not hanging your shingle on the door saying we're here nine to five, here's our address, come see us. That means these agencies are sending people out to the streets, they're sending people out uh, to homes, to hospitals, to places where people uh, have a need and that need is met uh, around violence, especially around those who are at the highest risk, and then addressing trauma. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which we'll also talk about in just a little bit, and other ways uh, that uh, group therapy, peer sessions, ways that people address trauma, and then providing the big small stuff. Big small stuff is stuff that's big to the individual who you're trying to help, who you're trying to provide services for, but it's small to the providers. For instance, uh, uh, go, going to, to the drugstore to buy some gauze, some neosporin, and some saline spray for somebody who's recovering from an injury, and maybe some wrap so they could rewrap it. Uh, that total package is about 30 bucks. It's small to the to the custom notification group who goes to get it, but it's major and probably big to the individual who has been shot and had no idea, number one, that these existed for them, that number two, that they need to use them, and then number three, how to use them. And then providing links to traditional services. Again, a lot of the traditional services, uh, they're brick and mortar, they have, um, they have uh, shingles on their door that gives their working hours, but a lot of these traditional services need the work of outreach to bring individuals to them so they can access the, uh, the programming and the help that's there for them. The goals are to recognize that people's progress uh, towards finishing and all that kind of stuff we're, are really, we wanna recognize people's progress. We're, it's not about completing a program, it's more about the progress within the program and does the work of the program keep individuals or help individuals to not be out there shooting and cutting up and then really to, de to develop real formal, formal measures of success for these around these goals, which means having small wins, having small victories, and having the ability to help people understand that their trauma that has produced violence and the lack of, uh, not the lack of resources, it's the trauma, helping to address that trauma uh, and keep people safe, again, alive and out of prison. Uh, someone once told me after a CBT uh, session that the CBT really helps you think about what you're thinking about. And so when you're looking at those services, uh, li providing links to them and helping individuals uh, get to these uh, social services, helping them get to treatments, helping them get to uh, the services that are offered, helping them get to the offices of individuals who are offering services, that can be a bear. So being able to make links to them uh, is, is, is absolutely important because while these services are out there and most folks don't go and access them, these services are not advertised on the social media pages of the folks who need them most. Uh, that's the purpose of the, the outreach and creating links to the traditional services. So one of the methods uh, is custom notifications, and, and I'll, I'll go into that in j for just a little bit. The customs are, are a way to reach individuals at home at streets, on, on the streets, excuse me, um, in their hospitals, or wherever individuals are who need the message. It, you have a small group of representatives. By small, I mean it can be two. Law enforcement and, say, the project manager. Law enforcement and, say, the, the support and outreach coordinator. Uh, law enforcement and the support and outreach provider. Law enforcement and each of these for a custom notification to be a custom, we're talking about uh, law enforcement message of deterrence being a part of the notification process. And then the advantages of the custom, as I said earlier, the, 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 the call-in takes a little bit to plan, maybe a, uh, a month, 
couple of months, depending on the, the number of people you have to coordinate for speakers and uh, the, the place where you're going to meet and all the logistics, that can take a while. But the custom notification, it's a quick and rapid response to street level um, developments and anything that's happening in the streets. Whereas a call-in calls in a swath of individuals who represent multiple groups, the custom notification goes right uh, to that person who is most at risk today, or the people connected to that person who is most at risk, or those persons who are most at risk, and it's personalized. You're going to reach those who are at the highest risk. In, in any situation uh, where there's a need for a custom notification, amongst any group and amongst all individuals who may be a part of the same group or different groups, you're going to have beefs. You don't only have beefs amongst uh, different groups. Sometimes there's internal beefing that happens or there's an internal situation to where you have members of the same group who are, are retaliating against each other, uh, whether they say that on social media, whether it's in their YouTube or a rap song or something like that, which however you find out about it, the custom notification can go to both sides uh, and interrupt their violence by putting both sides on notice uh, that they're on the radar they're not anonymous and that there are people in the community who care about them and don't want to see anyone from either side uh, shot and killed. Also, if there's a hot spot, of course, what makes hot spots hot is hot speed, hot people. So being able to go to those hot people and, and have quick conversations with them, uh, kind of like what uh, what uh, Isaac and Chief Raskowski do in, in, in South Bend. If there's a, someone who needs a message immediately, they'll go right to those to cool those hot spots. And then for individuals who are not called in or folks who we're not able to be in the call in, or you just had a call in a month ago, your next call in and schedule for, the, for another three months, your outreach and direct outreach allows individuals to be reached immediately and not have to wait on a call in. It's an individualized message. The message goes to the person or persons uh, who, you're, who you're aiming to talk at because of their group involvement. And then it goes from them to their group. Uh, it's, it's a specific way to lay out information to individuals that's palatable, it's understandable, and the action is to not do shooting. So it's actionable. And you can do them in a family setting. I recommend as much as possible doing these in settings to where there is someone who is an influential, that's someone who they are influential over, or someone who is influential over them, being a part of the messaging that you're giving to the group members who you're trying to see. So the core elements of the custom notification. Number one, you have to identify those impact players who are the most at risk. Identifying them is critical. Uh, making sure that your your frontline officers are a part of those conversations and are able to lean in uh, is going to be important. I say your frontline because folks, a lot of times you have your your bosses, your your lieutenants, uh, your captains, chiefs, and deputy chiefs. They're just not as in touch with what's happening on the ground as say your sergeants and your other frontline folks uh, who are on the uh, on the ground. And so when I say that because. If I'm doing a ride along in a community and I want to know most about the community, I want somebody who's frontline, somebody who knows uh, when we get out of the car at the at the 7-Eleven or we're going inside to buy our, uh, you know, our chocolate milk or our Gatorades, whatever. Uh, there'll be guys outside that 7-Eleven who, if I'm with an officer, let's just say uh, his name is Officer Davis, and they'll say, what's up, Davis? And Officer Davis will be able to say back to them, What's up to whatever their name is, whoever they are. What's important is that they know Davis. They know he's legit. They'll speak to him. They'll say, what's up? No, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll put stuff behind their back or hide stuff or do whatever it is that they're doing in his presence. And they know that he's legit enough for them to speak to. He's going to speak to them. And there's not going to be a whole lot of back and forth or bantering and nobody's going to jail today just based on you saying what's up. What's more important is I could say to Officer Davis, Tell me about that individual. Tell me about this guy over here. He can usually tell me what time he comes out to the to the block. He can tell me when he hangs out at the 7-Eleven, who's out there with him, who his partners are, who he's beefing with, who his girlfriend is. He can usually tell you if the guy has uh, additional uh, PlayStation or additional uh, video gaming account that he's playing Call of Duty on because 
he'll know the individuals. They know the stuff that impact players are a part of. And your frontline officers usually have more real uh, on the uh, in real time information than say your lieutenants, chiefs and bosses do. So it's good to be able to identify the uh, impact players with them, create a custom legal assessment. Um, each time I look at this, y'all, I always say I need to get another letter with bigger uh, words because nobody can see this on my PowerPoint. So I apologize to you that you're seeing the, these small letters. Uh, but what this is, is the first paragraph basically says that this is the city of Newburgh. It describes uh, the reason why we're talking. The next describes the initiative. Next paragraph says we want to help you. Uh, GVI is here to help you with uh, the, the menu of offerings that uh, come with GVI and then to let them know of their legal risk. The, the next paragraph lets you basically says, here's your record. We've determined that based on uh, your criminal history or your past, these are the things that can happen to you if, for you with your continued in, in involvement in violence. Folks, that's major to say that to individuals, put it in writing, give it to them, and then read it to them, and then let you know the last paragraph says, look, we're talking to other people. This is the name of the strategy. This is the way we're doing business moving forward. Please take us up on the help. Whether you do or not, your involvement in violence must stop. That's a powerful letter to hand to individuals. And the fact that it comes from police who are saying that we're not here to lock you up, we're not here to bust the door open to serve a search warrant, and we're not here to take anybody else on a search warrant and you're alive, so we're not coming to give you a death notice, but that's the way we're doing business moving forward. And then the logistics of the custom notification. <clears throat> Uh, the team can in include law enforcement, it always includes law enforcement, a community figure, someone who is respected, uh, the social service provider, street outreach worker, um, who are usually highly respected if they don't have one foot in the game and one foot out of the game. If, if they're wholly uh, on point, they're respected. The places, as I said before, it can be the house, the hospital, on the street, Anywhere where individuals who need the message uh, uh, can, can be found, deliver the message. Let me give a caveat there that uh, if you find folks on the street and there's one individual you want to reach to, but there are individuals on the street with two or three other people or their partners or their friends, uh, you don't just talk to the one talk to all of them and give that one messaging for the one to everyone that they're hanging out with because they are now influentials and you're able to give that message succinctly and you're not hemming them up jamming them up and making the making their partners think oh that they're a snitch or anything like that you're talking to everyone there and then you want to track it who has received the message and what was said who did they receive it from did they receive it from the community moral voice as i said before the community moral voice uh, has some power of uh, informal social control. Folks, there, there'll be a time when police can say something or your activists can say something and that, says, that means a little bit. But when your aunties say something, that says a lot. Uh, there are people in your community who most of us uh, don't want uh, to know our, our business, especially if we're cutting up. Uh, for some folks, it's the grandmas in the community. For others, it's the uh, the old mavens in the community, or the the old heads, uh, uh, or the OGs who you know have said basically keep my block clean. It's those people who are community moral voices. And when I say OGs, I'm not talking about just original gangsters or old gangsters. I mean people who have been in the community long enough that most of us in the community call them OG out of respect, uh, and it doesn't mean that the negative connotations that may be in uh, the broader media. So the, the goal of the community moral voice is to promote that informal social control so you don't have to have uh, the cop. By, by show of hands, uh, if you can use your, your hand emoji, um, how many folks growing up were afraid of the firefighters in your community? Let's see the, you go ahead and use your hand emoji. Yep, not a lot of people suspected that. Uh, how many folks growing up in the community were afraid, genuinely afraid of, let's say, FBI agents, if you knew what they were? All right, Danya, I hear you. Uh, how many folks were, uh, yeah, thanks, Cheryl, okay, I got it. Um, how many were afraid of um, the cops in the community? Genuinely afraid, like just terrified. Okay, got it, growing up. 
how many growing up and or grown now are afraid of your mama? Wow, look at all these hands. <laughs> look at all these hands. There you go. We're talking about that level. Thank you, folks. That level of social, informal social control to where there are things in the community that you don't want Miss Mabel going uh, to her mailbox, see you out there cutting up. There are members in the community. I know we say that that doesn't exist anymore, but it does. There are members in the community when they walk down the street those who are cutting up on the corner on the block in their own yards will say hold up chill out while such and such is going down the street just out of respect and just because of who they are not just in the community but to the individuals who they're standing in front of uh, a lot of times that could be your again it could be your activists but usually it's your aunties activists and aunties are part of the same conversation but they have different standings and different roles <clears throat> in the community and then identifying those influentials. Who are those people uh, that 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 the guys you're trying to see respect? Um, uh, my my colleague Heather Conley says, you ask them, find out from them who they respect, and then be able to say, all right, that's who we're plugging in uh, to the conversation around influentials, folks. A custom notification works. Uh, most powerfully when influentials are present. They don't necessarily have to be a part of delivering the message, but their, their presence is most important. And then these happen with police. Custom notifications should be done as a team whenever possible. So those very important uh, informal social controllers in the community, those people who have high standing moral voices, those people standing next to the police, uh, one group is going to legitimize the other. It is very, very rare. Let me say it out loud. It is very rare that individuals who have particular standing in the community, their standing is compromised because they're standing next to police. Your standing in your community does not change based on who's standing around you. If you're hardcore, that's who you are in the community. Folks know that you mean the community. Well, just because the cops show up doesn't mean that you lose your legitimacy. And if your legitimacy in the community is that weak that you can't stand next to the police or it's not that secure yet or the community isn't ready for that, that's something to keep in mind, but for, for the most of us, for most people who do this work and have done this work, the police being there or not being there doesn't really compromise your personal standing in the community. It could impact the, how, the, how that meeting goes, but it doesn't usually impact the, the standing of the community standing of the person who's giving, the non-sworn person who's giving the custom notification, particularly your street outreach workers. Most street outreach workers, you are who you are and the people in the community know it they can speak to a place that most other people cannot speak to your street outreach workers are savvy enough and have been around enough and they know enough to not say to the individuals who they're talking to on the streets uh yeah i ran these same streets yeah i ran these same streets 20 years ago uh so i know what it's all about it, it, you, most street outreach workers know not to say that because you say that to guys on the street today and they'll they'll let you know the streets hadn't been the same in seven months. The streets definitely haven't been the same since uh, since George Floyd and definitely have not been the same uh, since the start of the pandemic when so many things were brought to light and the disparities in those communities. Street outreach workers know how to keep the conversation the right conversation and not say the things that will kill their legitimacy or yours. And then they, they depend on and need for law enforcement to do the same. Can law enforcement have the same kind of impact and having the right law enforcement officials doing custom notifications? A lot of times you'll find your, some SWAT guys will say, I don't want to do that. You'll find some guys who are, you know, really enforcement heavy and really don't want to do that. If folks don't want to do customs or do street outreach, don't force them to do that. You want folks who want to do the custom notifications, who are willing and able to do custom notifications. Law enforcement, it goes for the same. Just like you vet the folks who are not sworn, who you will have on, in front of uh, group members doing custom notifications, you want to vet those who are sworn, having them doing custom notifications. Again, small letters here, so let me just kind of walk us through it. The prep tracker is one where you're looking at who is being customed. 
what's the criminal history? What's the social media workup on them? Do you have a social media workup of them standing in front of guns, posting videos or rapping or hanging out with other people who do the same thing or posted up with a bunch of dope on the table? Or, you know, that the, uh, the when I say rapping, I mean, rap, uh, the battle rapper, the rapping against um, others from other groups, rapping against their ops, saying, we're in your backyard, come get us because that's what's gonna happen. Uh, you wanna know what all does social media say? And then the custom notification letter, you want to update that letter so it has the right information about the individuals you're going to go speak. And then who the team is. The day of that uh, meeting, you brief those who are non-sworn, who may not know um, everything they need to know to deliver their part in the custom. You go deliver the custom, make sure that there's a safety plan in place, and then you come back and debrief it after the custom. You organize that information in such a way that your partners can track their part of the work in the database. The database doesn't have to have all partners seeing all information, but partners should be able to see their part in the work as you're looking at uh, the debrief on the custom notification and, victing, uh, and tracking what victims asked for or received what. So the overarching message from law enforcement, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk briskly through this, is that this is a part of a citywide effort. Um, law enforcement and, and those who are non-law enforcement who are doing the customs with them, they make it clear that the reason uh, that you all are in the faces of individuals who you're talking to or group members you're talking to is because they have come on the radar, there's a reason, you can explain the reason they're on the radar and then let them know that the legal risks and their legal exposure are real and explain it to them in real time and in plain language. Don't need a whole bunch of jargon, just plain as possible, the plain language that they'll understand. That comes from all folks, but law enforcement, while they deliver that, that custom legal letter comes from law enforcement. It does not come from a non-sworn community member. It comes from uh, law enforcement. Uh, and while you're there, law enforcement, you're not treating folks as perps. You're not talking to folks disrespectfully. You're not sitting there with your hand over your holster. Matter of fact, uh, your, 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 your weapon, your sidearm is uh, securely fastened. You're not sitting there like you're ready to pull it out at any moment. You're just having a community conversation as a community member. Uh, and for law enforcement, uh, you'll hear me say this a lot. Law enforcement is a part of the community. That's two words, a part of the community, not apart from it. Law enforcement is a part of the community and is a part of the messaging where you're saying, we wanna keep you safe, alive and out of prison, to, excuse me, telling folks why they're on the radar and then giving them the exact consequences if they don't stop and then walking away. And after you tell them, tell everybody in your group what we've told you today and then handing that messaging over to non-sworn community members who will reiterate the offer of help, articulate our standards in our community against violence, but for our community members and then making sure that that credible voice that you're giving is speaking loudly killing and violence is wrong here's how it has impacted me please don't put another mother through what i've been through please don't put another brother through what i've been through and please don't put your mother your brother and people in your circle through this by you being the one being shot and killed or by you being taken off the streets because you were doing some shooting and killing. That's community messaging. It lets people know that we stand with law enforcement in this community because they are acting legitimately. We would not, and again, for those who have that community standing, this is when you're saying, uh, you, I've heard my colleague Sasha Cotton say this, I wouldn't be standing here with these cops if they weren't acting legitimately. So making sure that you have vetted everyone who's a part of the customs and you're able to say honestly that folks are standing with legitimacy. So the moral engagement, folks should be treated as responsible human beings because they are. Uh, by giving them, uh, by putting rational choice theory to work, you're giving them rational information to make rational decisions with. By doing that, you're, you're, while you may have the heart to do the work, you're showing and demonstrating that you are smart enough to do the work by considering those pieces. The moral engagement that comes from all of us, 
everyone who does a customer, who does street outreach, or who does uh, this work where you're having direct communication and direct messaging, is that you want to see folks safe, alive, and out of prison, challenging the street code, which is wrong. There is no gray area here. We want to see you safe, alive, and out of prison, and we want to see your colleagues, your friends, and even your ops safe, alive, and out of prison. And it treats people with respect. It's procedurally just. And when you're looking at the legitimacy that goes with this, it's the behaviors, it's the messaging, and it's the post uh, behaviors after messaging that strengthen the legitimacy here. And then from the social service folks, spell out what's available. Here is what we have. Here's the list of, of options. If it's not available, you do not offer it. Uh, I'm going to say this, and I want all of us to hear this. You do not let your mouth write a check that your behind cannot cash. You under promise over deliver. And in many cases, you just deliver based on what is necessary or what folks need. Um, I want to give us a little clip to just let us see how uh, custom notifications worked in uh, Chicago. And this is a documentary, or excuse me, a, a piece that was produced in 2018, but it was reflecting on the work uh, as of 2017 in Chicago. So if you'll give me 10 more minutes, um, I'd like to just uh, share a clip with you and then we can, uh, we can wrap up and go from there. Michael A, is that okay? Yeah, perfect, Paul, thank you. Okay, great. Um, let's go to a 60 minutes clip. And that's what GBI works to do, to bring community resources to bear. Um, here's why it works. Putting people on prior notice is absolutely important. Custom notifications create routine communications and then continuously keeping the message fresh and fueling positive individual and group accountability. <clears throat> it works because we understand that there's a very small population who are the drivers of gun violence. Uh, you saw in the video, they knew who Laquan was, they knew who each of the individuals were. But when you look and, at the data, we know this to be true across the cities, that, they're, that these populations, they're more likely to be victims of gun violence uh, once they have been victims. But honestly, too often, the focus in our interventions or our preventative measures typically don't go to that popula population. Uh, and really, in large part, because they're not going to the nonprofits to seek support or government, uh, but they take a look at the 80% of the people who are, have unstable housing, 82% of them who are 18 years or older and have been victims of violence. They've been shot, they've been shot at, or had a close associates shot. 70% of the people who in any community, including yours, you serve, uh, have been victims and, or survivors of gun violence. And really, honestly, that number will look like 100% because nobody just wakes up one day and says, you know, I'm going to be a group member and go shoot people. Um, most of the individuals have been victims first. And what we're experiencing is that concentrated number of survivors of gun violence and the impact and the ripples effect that that has not only on them, but as the community itself. So successful programming has a few principles in common. One is that understanding that success is not linear. So in your direct communication, you're doing that with that as an understanding. It takes ebbs and flows for participants to get ironed out. So if the idea is to give a program just a year to determine its success or failure, then you're really wasting time and money. Because uh, for people who have experienced any bit of trauma, it can take years to unpack all of that. And people who spend time in prison, they've experienced trauma. People who've had their loved ones go away and be incarcerated or killed or shot, they have experienced trauma and that needs to be unpacked and dealt with there as well. And then it's imperative that we build additional capacity around the existing capacity. Charles said in the video, no one's riding in on a, ride ho on a white horse to save us. Uh, the savior's right there in the community and he's right. The savior does need existing capacity and then additional capacity. So making sure to strengthen that is, is critically important. And then bringing on not more outreach workers, but bringing the quality of the outreach work will help you not to have to have so much quantity. And then here's the bottom line. The bottom line is the issues around street violence happens fast. Uh, 
regular and early engagement can prevent those homicides and then delivering effective communications, be they the call in street outreach and communications, CPRVV, whatever the effective communication is, making sure that there's follow up and that it's that the work is sustainable by adding the capacity and that in no matter what site, no matter what city you're in, uh, the folks who are on the ground understand that this is the way we do business in the community, no matter who's sitting in the mayor's chair, no matter who's sitting in the chief's chair or the superintendent's chair. Uh, that's direct communication. Um, I, uh, Michael, I did go over just a little bit, but let me hand it back to you and would love to hear just what the conversation or thoughts are from the rest of the group. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. That was Absolutely. fantastic. Um, so yeah, now we'd like to open it up to uh, all the participants to ask questions or thoughts, uh, things that were going through your mind when Paul went through the presentation or the video, um, and also allow our other staff members who are very experienced uh, with their own experiences in the field doing custom notifications, call and CPR VVs um, to weigh in as well. So if folks want to ask questions, then our staff could kind of field them and discuss their own experiences. So um, we'll hand it over to you all now. Isaac, I see your hands up. Uh, great presentation, Mr. Smith, Paul Smith. It was good to see Charles Perry's face on the, on the video as well. We did great work together. Um, question I have for you is, with the ages of, we've been doing GBI now going 10 years. And with the age we start off was 15 to 28, somewhere around there, the age of the um, um, people who were defenders and stuff like that, the defendants. Now it's dropped down to 13 to 20, 28. And a lot of it is dealing with juveniles and in school corporations. How do you balance the GBI strategy and conversations with those two organizations? Um, we found in, in Louisville, uh, this is a lesson we've learned out of Louisville, in their community incident reviews, they have two sets of reviews. They have a shooting review that happens with just law enforcement. And then they have a community incident review where law enforcement is informing those who will do street outreach without the police uh, on the, the, the dynamics of the violence on the ground. In that community incident review, they have school personnel from central office and then the school personnel who come in at the, uh, uh, at the uh, SRO level. Uh, and they'll talk about any incidents that were, where youth were victims or youth were involved, <clears throat> but the data that we're seeing out of most of our sites says that while there may be incidents that involve youth, the youth are not increasingly being a part of incidents. Uh, so basically the, the majority of the shootings and the, uh, the homicides still include uh, adults for the most part. But to have those conversations with them is to invite them to the table. So if there's an incident review in town, or if there is a way for them to be plugged into helping with uh, custom notifications, say there is an incident that involves youth, I would involve those agencies that work with youth anyway and find out how they can be a part of custom notifications or direct messaging, uh, CPRVV and the like. Great question. Does anyone else have any specific questions or uh, things that maybe went uncovered in the presentation or things you'd like Paul or any of our colleagues to kind of dig in on a bit? Yeah, Mike, I see your hands up. Hey, good afternoon. So uh, I'm Michael Douglas. I'm with the uh, city of Minneapolis um, with the uh, Neighborhood Safety Department, which is the new home for violence prevention. And my background is uh, I'm a media relations coordinator for for uh, the violence prevention here. And one thing I thought was kind of important throughout this communication that you all were talking about, um, that it took um, 60 minutes coming from outside of Chicago, coming in to tell the tell the message of the work. And so one thing that I've uh, that I'm working with our team here is about one knowing your message. Um, owning your message and communicating that message because a lot of time dealing with electeds and 
um, police and things of that nature, they try to tell your your work for you and they really don't know it. So the only thing that I could uh, say or you know, really compliment is understanding that 60 minute piece that they didn't have clips from the Chicago media. That you had someone who did research. So in, in your messaging with your victims and with the electives that you have to deal with, remember to um, the media that where you are, they don't understand your work either. And making that a priority to explain via on camera, not with victims, what it is and do it consistently. Cause that's one thing I'm working with our team to now start doing. Cause you know, Sasha was here, but I started when as Sasha was leaving, but I saw see the, the importance of that messaging that y'all kept saying, but especially when it comes to the media picking up on the crime, but not really understanding that the, each one of those persons that, that was pointed out, they have existing trauma, they have a story and no one's cared enough to really speak to it unless they're coming from outside, i.e. like 60 Minutes did, and really capturing their stories. Because again, I went to, I went to grad school there in Chicago, so I, I know the different markets. So I think just knowing the message, you know, and communicating it and owning it and correcting those in the moment if they are wrong, because again, ultimately it impacts the perception of your work. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say this um, because uh, part of the messaging is <clears throat> that we'll help you if you let us, but we'll stop you if you make us. That's in a custom notification, that's in a CPRVV, that's in a call-in. What the CPRVV, the custom and the call-ins are not designed to do, and this is where the media gets it wrong every time, the media thinks that these are ways to get into people's spaces to do investigations, and that's just not it. There, there's another unit for that. Uh, th th this is a fully support outreach and helping individuals understand that the community wants to see the human beings safe, alive, and out of prison, but they also want to see human beings stop shooting and killing other human beings. That's it. That's the crux of it. And there are the pieces that the media will get wrong, but you're right. You want to make sure that someone inside your agency or your organization is tracking your own data and you're telling your own narrative so you can control the narrative and control what gets put out there. And then also uh, when you have responsible media, not yellow journalists, responsible media coming in and they're able to tell and share the story in different art forms and put them on different platforms. And just think about it, since in the last six years, there have been a plethora of new platforms where people can share stories, share narratives and, and get correct information out there that's why this is always evolving uh none of us who are doing the work want to sustain the work as it was back in 1993. we don't even want to sustain it as it was in 2003 or 2013 it's 2013. Uh, we want now that we're in 2023 squarely you want to sustain the work through its evolutions so it doesn't look exactly like it did before and lessons learned moving forward we've been able to incorporate them city by city site by site and we're not looking at just best practices we're looking at practices that are best for your site in your city in your community thank you michael and thank you paul uh there's a question in the chat that um I'll read on Paul, maybe you or one of our other colleagues want to answer, which is what about youth 11 to 14 that are highly mobile and not attending school? The age group has been recently increasing with violence and um, any suggestions or ways to address that? Why don't I give this uh, space to some of my other colleagues that have been taking up a lot of time here. All right, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> From a former school principal and former school teacher, um, if the, the, the truancy laws and the truancy uh, codes are not in effect, you still want to be able to reach out to these individuals. I wouldn't re recommend doing call-ins and things like that for the youth. Custom notifications are exceptional, especially when it comes to youth having their influentials around. So mom, dad, uh, uh, grandma, um, extended members of the family and becoming team, whoever that person's name is. Um, I highly recommend that if, if you're not able to use the school system, that you use other systems that work with youth 
Uh, but I would not try to conflate the work with youth, that's specifically with youth, with this work, which has federal teeth. The feds have no teeth in what happens with the youth in most cases. So I would, I would at least reach out to those other agencies who deal with and work with youth, uh, because I think, uh, I think in many ways you want to make sure that you're not conflating the two, uh, so that your initiatives are separate and your initiatives that are designed for adults who are kind of doing a reentry type thing or is one thing but your youth who still need to be educated, who still need to grow up, and who still have a hypothalamus that's developing, you're able to create meaningful and right programming for them, stuff that's science-informed and, 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 uh, and data-informed, not data-driven, data-informed. Great question, whoever asked that. Thank you, Paul. I see in the chat, uh, Isaac or Scott, did you wanna weigh in as well on this topic? Is that Chief Ruskowski? Hi, Paul. It's been a while. Yeah, I, I kind of volunteered Isaac too because he can elaborate a little bit more. But I think as, as another part to that, to that good question was, look, what, one of the reasons that we do talk to the adults is number one, legally, it's a heck of a lot easier and there's a lot less red tape. Number two, the hope with not just the message uh, getting to them and their counterparts, but also as to I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but man up and and take them kids under your wing and say, y'all need to stop this. That that is uh, th that's part of the the goal. It's not just one piece; it's several pieces to that ultimate goal to to spread that to the kids. Um, you know, here in South Bend, we have our juvenile justice center. They've been remarkable working with us. We have five star program and and things like that. And and we actually have people that are fully on board with what we're trying to do from the adult side. And they're incorporating that into the the juvenile side of things. Um, we're also making some pretty good headway. I think Kareem is on here uh, with our school corporation, and I can tell you that our safe out, outreach team had had some difficulties getting into the school system originally, but they've made remarkable strides in getting into our school, our our middle and even elementary schools, and just taught just simple little things where the yep. kids have somebody to look up to and look forward to, and that is literally half the battle what we've had to deal with here. Yeah, I echo the sentiments of, of Chief um, and everybody on the call. I just like to tell you, let y'all know we have the best chief in the United States. So if you really want to learn how to do something, talk to Scott Rakowski. <laughs> I need a raise, Chief. Um, <laughs> but um, I sentiment what he says. Uh, being in the schools is really being proactive and uh, and working with uh, doing trainings for teachers about gang awareness and gang understanding because um, for the teachers to be able to understand what's going, play, going on in the schools and be able to see the signs and the sim or symbols of different gang activity, it can be taken care of before the incident begins to take place. Having our SAVE outreach team involved in it at lunch time, you know what I'm saying, with the students and also uh, we have uh, another part that uh, Goodwill is doing called Straight Up is doing actual curriculum because a lot of times we talk to individuals, but we don't we don't identify the sickness of the individual. We just see the person, right? So I say the sin, that the sin is not the person, it's the sin that you got to deal with, right? So we look at it and we say, uh, we got to change the rules in which they live by, right? They live by the rules, thou shall carry a gun, thou shall be loyal to the street, thou shall be down with my clique, thou shall carry a gun. What about teaching these type of thought, uh, thought processes, thou most valuable possession you own is thou own life. Thou will not lead thy friend to danger. So when you start changing the mode of the inner person, and then they build in a relationship with you, and you're walking the walk, and you're talking the talk, it's better caught than taught. And then having a relationship between the school corporation and JJC, now we're advocates in JJC for the parents. And we're able to talk to the parents. Now we're getting referrals from JJC. Now we got mental health counseling for the parents. We put them to work at Goodwill. We're helping them with school stuff. We're visiting them at home. That's that full wraparound service that you could really do to really catch that low hanging fruit, like Paul said, big and small things. Uh, that's really helped us uh, in working with some of the juveniles as well. Beautiful. Thank you both for weighing in there with very thorough responses. Uh, there's one great question in the chat right now from Rodney 
Uh, how often is it necessary to begin with a broader police community reconciliation effort prior to initiating the direct slash custom communication? I wouldn't say begin with the reconciliation effort, but you do want to include it if possible. Um, reconciliation is, is rooted deeply in legitimacy, uh, but so is GVI. And if you're having the same conversation around GVI, um, when you're able to uh, produce numbers that GVI produces, folks, when you're able to stand as, uh, because Chief Son, I'll, I'll, I'll use his, him as an example, when, uh, when Chief Raskowski stands in front of a group, it'll be easier for him to say, uh, we acknowledge that policing has not been 100% in this country. We acknowledge that some agencies, and I don't know if, if, if South Bend's was or not, but some agencies were formed in this country and formulated in this country around slave catching uh, agencies, police agencies from the South that were uh, formed to bring them back down and the agencies from the North who were formed to take them back down. So when you look at that as a broader historical standpoint, uh, any chief can go right into practices in their own city and say, hey, the way we handle group violence, gang violence before uh, was not right. Uh, the stop and frisk, the, the, the saturation patrols, the, the basically what the community considers to be community terrorism uh, was not right. We were the tip of the spear enforcing laws that the police did not write. And then being able to say honestly to a group or honestly in a meeting, we didn't get it right. Now we're doing things right. And once we started doing things right, here's the data to discuss that. Here's the data that proves it. And then asking for individuals to say, look, you've heard how we feel about the historical policing. You've seen what we've done so far. We'd still like to hear from you. And then inviting those community members in to have uh, listening sessions and to be a part of having their voice at the table. And I'll say to everyone here, um, you've probably heard me say this before, in most of these cases, these communities, and I set this present, I set this at the very top of the call, in our communities that we're talking about, we see that a lot of folks feel like they were at the table before, but they were on the menu. Uh, a reconciliation process and legitimacy altogether helps those same people to come back to the table but this time to be seated in the seats where decisions are being made. So I wouldn't say it's important to start with it, uh, but uh, the, what the science and what the data and what, uh, what we're seeing every day is that every department should in some way try to figure out how to include or develop a reconciliation process or truth and transformation process in your community to accompany your GBI. Uh, when, when, when the cops are legit and the reconciliation is happening, it makes for a nicer, safer community. Police are a part of the community, not apart from it, and should be at the same table with everyone else at the community. Thank, Thank you. you. And again, that was a fantastic question. And we're going to have a workshop series, a workshop later in the series about legitimacy and police community reconciliation. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, on that note, we're actually going to wrap up for the day. Um, just have a few housekeeping items that I'll share. I can get screen sharing working. All right. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, our next session will be a deep dive on support and outreach on Thursday, April 20th. Um, I know Paul went into support and outreach a bit today and it goes kind of, it's an interconnected topic through direct communication, but it's gonna be more of a deep dive uh, specifically devoted to support and outreach. Um, why non-traditional approach to social services is needed for GVI and the GVI high risk population. Uh, best practices we've seen around the country and around the world. Um, and the importance of legitimacy in support and outreach. Um, but then again, future sessions will include deep dives on discrete topics like legitimacy, which will come in future weeks, and community moral voices, which Paul again spoke a bit about today, as well as managing resources and partnerships, institutionalization, and things like that. Um, for any outreach, or if anyone wants to get in touch with us, you can email gbiworkshop at nnscommunities.org. Feel free to pass that along to any of your colleagues or contacts or anyone who would want to learn about these workshops, um, all the materials from the workshops, join future workshops. Um, and you could also go to our website, nnscommunities.org slash GBI workshop, where we'll, we have the previous workshops, the recordings, the slides, the materials, everything is uploaded there. 
And after this week's session, we'll upload that with today's recording, today's slide deck, the video, um, and any other materials that are particularly relevant uh, for this session. So thank you all for joining. Thank you, Paul, again, for the fantastic presentation. Feel free to reach out with any questions and pass our info along. And thank you again for coming.